of us. But we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. Before I do, before I go into what I, what I feel like the Lord wants to talk about today, I want to thank your pastors for allowing me to come. Uh, Pastor Catherine, you're amazing at holding down the fort when Pastor Adam's doing his thing in Africa, letting the Lord use him in, in a way that all of us peasants wish we could do. Right? Right. You know, I was asked, have you ever been to Africa? No, I would love to go, but I have not made it there yet. He's doing the Lord's work in a way that I wish I could, but have not made it yet. So it's amazing that you have a pastor that only sees the heart here, but wants to reach the heart out there in places where people don't want to go. Like in places where it is scary to go, right? It's scary to say the name of Jesus in places that your pastor is at preaching. Right. It's scary to go to those things. See, sometimes we think it's scary to to walk out into a neighborhood and just be who we are. But be who you are in a neighborhood where you can't even be the person you want to be and still be that person. That's scary. But your pastor's doing that. And it blesses me to even be connected to that. To even say that, yeah, he is my friend. He is my friend. And I pray for him. I hope y'all are praying for him, that he gets back here safety, safe and, and just ready to take on this thing that I know God's going to charge him up while he's there. Listen, I tell people all the time, if you want to be an encourager, then encourage. Right? If you want to be charged up, then go out and do something for the kingdom to get charged up. You can't be charged up sitting in your seat on Sunday. Right? Oh, but I'm listening to the word. Yes, but you're not doing nothing with it. Right? So if your pastors come in here and they equip you and you do nothing with it, then you're going to leave here feeling empty. Right? Some of you all say, well, I didn't get nothing from worship because it's not about you. I, did, I don't like that song, Spirit Breakout. Why? Because it's not about you. If it was about you, you would have got everything out of it. If it was about, I don't know if there's a Drew in the house, but, but Drew, we lift you up. Man, you're going to feel on fire, right? Because we're talking about you. We're lifting you up. But this is what happens. It says that he inhabits is the praise of his people. So when you lift up his name, not only does he lift him up off the throne and say something's happening in Kansas City, right, at Reach KC, something's taking place, and he sees you pressing in. He dispatches his angels about your life, that what you're going through, what you came in here with, you don't have to leave here with, right? That you leave here feeling charged up on fire. Listen, we're going to get to the notes eventually. But you're going to leave here with something. So any opportunity that you can give God something that he can't give himself, you need to take advantage of that. Because he's going to give you something that you can't give yourself. And that's victory. Somebody will get it. We're going to get it. I'm going to talk about this is how we fight. This is how we fight our battles. Right. We're all battling something. Right. I may not know the enemy that you're facing. I may not know the circumstances that you're going through, but I need to encourage you today that there's victory in Jesus, that whatever it is, whatever it looks like, whatever it feels like, there's victory at some point in Jesus. The challenging part is that it doesn't always feel like it. Right. Sometimes these attacks they come at the worst times. They come and catch us so off guard that we feel like victory is a million miles away. And that sometimes it feels like it would just be easier to lay down than wait on victory. But what if I told you you've been walking in victory this whole time? That what looks like defeat is just a small battle that you're going through. But it's not the war. Right? How many of y'all face some battles in your life that you know you've lost? Right? But how many of y'all are winning the war currently? <laughs> there shouldn't be a hand down right now. Why? Because there's still breath in your lungs. Why? Because there's still heart beating in your chest. Why? Because you still stood up this morning and said, devil, if you could have killed me, you would have. If you could have taken me out, you should have. But he didn't because he can't because you're walking in victory. I'm about to read something 
this scripture, it's really long. I'm going to cut a lot out, and it's going to be a little bit of Matthew Standard Version because there's some big names in here, and I'm still not trying to look silly for you all. Come on. I'm going to start in Joshua 10. There, it's, it's, we're gonna be, it's before that. Hang on to that for a second. We're going to get there. It says, now King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had captured Ai and completely destroyed it, treating Ai and the king as he did in Jericho and its king. And the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were living among them. So Adonai Zedek and his people were greatly alarmed because Gibeon was a large city like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all the men were warriors. Therefore, this king of Jerusalem sent word to other kings, his five homies. He said, come up and help me. We will attack Gibeon, right? Because he couldn't do it himself. So he had to call on his friends, right, to come up and help him. He says, so the five of the kings, Amorites of Jerusalem and all these other places, advanced their armies and besieged Gibeon and fought against it. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, don't give up on your servants. Come quickly and save us. Help us, for the Amorite kings living in the hill country have joined forces against us. Let me paint this picture. You have a king who's frustrated, right? You have a king that's looking at Gilgal, looking at Gibeon, and he's saying, look, they've already taken it over. Not only did they take it over, but they've made peace, and I want to go up there, and I want to take back what it is. And this king's like, I know I can call on my five, my four friends, and we're going to rally the troops, and we're going to go up here, and we're going to do what we know we can do. But the people in Gibeon are like, hey, Joshua, we need you. We're, fi- we're in this thing. They've come, and they've taken over. We need you to come. Don't forget about us. Come back and help us. And this is what Joshua, see, Joshua's job was to help the Israelites settle into their promised land. But this land was occupied. And getting to this land would mean war. They'd have to fight. And God, would he would remain faithful. He'd conquer the lands, and he would even create allies. But as we just read, these five kids were in attack what God had already promised. But this is what he's doing to the church. Right now, the church is okay with being complacent, without moving forward in faith. If we just stay here, we'll be okay. We've locked this fortress down. Ain't nothing coming in here. We're okay. But this is what God said. God said, you cannot get comfortable and content and sit back and just do business as usual. We cannot rest on past victories and be paralyzed by past defeats. I've asked how many of you all have defeated, uh, been defeated in a battle, and many of you raised your hand, but are you still there? Because if you're still focused on the defeat of the battle, you'll never get to the next battle, the one that you're going to win. You'll never get to the next thing that the Lord has for me. See, some of us, I believe, have to fail at some point so that God can get us down here and say, hey, I still got you. Right? But this is what happens is when we get knocked down, we stay here. It's like, God, I'm, I'm already here. I'll just, I'll just worship you from here. It says to get on my knees. I'll just stay here. Right? This is good. The enemy won't defeat me here. Why? Because you're not doing nothing is, is why. Right? He has nothing to worry about if you're not advancing the kingdom. So the enemy's like, I ain't got to worry. They, they lazy Christians anyway. Just let them say, I've got other Christians out here doing stuff in Africa that I'm worried about. I'm not worried about this one that's on his knees saying, God, you're good. Of course God's good because you're not doing nothing to advance the kingdom in your life to cause any opposition to come against you. Of course God's good. If you're a lazy Christian and you don't get up and try to advance the kingdom and you can say, well, the enemy's not done nothing to me. Why would he? Why would he? You're a zero threat. To building the kingdom. We are to move forward in faith personally, but also corporately as a body. But here's how Joshua responds when he found out about these plans. This is where it comes up here. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his army. But look at this part. It says, with his best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Even if the Lord said that to you, many of us would still not go. Right? Because we've been defeated before. 
The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. Some, some translations say threw them into a panic. So Joshua and Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Ezekah and Mekedah. If you keep reading, the Bible says that, that, that the, the Lord sent a hailstorm. Right, that many of these people died from the hailstorm then that were dead that were killed by the sword of men that were fighting. So listen, you might be fighting something and you might say, I don't have enough people to get through this battle. I don't have enough people that have my back. I don't have enough support. And the Lord says, if you take a step, you I will defeat more than you'll defeat, but you'll get the victory. Come on, some of y'all need that. Some of y'all are going through some things and you feel all alone. You feel like you can't press any further. You feel like you can't do much more. And the Lord said, if you just step, I've already defeated them. I've already thrown them into confusion, into panic. All you have to do is show up. And when you show up, it's going to feel like a herd of cattle coming at them. They're going to be so confused. They're going to be in full panic that they're going to run. But when they run. I'm going to throw a hailstorm on them that they've never felt before, and they're going to be taken out. You're not going to have to worry about it anymore. Come on, here's four things we can learn. The first thing that Joshua did is he responded. After finding out about this attack, Joshua marches up with his best fighting men. He said he had to march all through the night. And you know what I love about this? He didn't say he grabbed his five friends or all his friends. He didn't say he grabbed the people he cuts up with and laughs and jokes with. No, it said he went and he picked up his best fighting men. And some of y'all are connected with some people right now that are bringing you down. But you're loyal to them. But every time you go into battle, you're the only one fighting. Every time, you, every time something happens, you're the only one that is praying. Every time something comes against you, you're the only one that's seeking the word. Every time something happens, they're the ones that are saying, the Lord is coming against me. But he says he grabbed his best fighting men. People with grit. People with integrity. People with intestinal fortitude that says, this is right. That won't question if we step. That won't say, why are we stepping? They just march with you. That won't have to worry about what's ahead. They'll know that they're taken care of. Listen, we are in this thing. I've got some news for you. You may not feel like you're in a war, but you're in a battle for your life. And if you're connected with people that won't shield you from things, then you're going to be constantly fighting behind a wall that's not protecting you. That you're going to have to look around to see if the enemy's coming because they're not telling you. That you're going to have to stand on a ladder to look over top because they're not guarding you. They're looking out for themselves. Why? Because they know if you're behind them, they don't have to watch their six. But here you are being guarded by a wall that you still have to do this the whole time. He didn't pretend like it wasn't going to happen. He took the information and said, all right, bet, let's go. I got you, 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 and you. Everyone else stay here. Y'all need to work on your prayer life. Y'all need to get right. I'm going to need you eventually, but I can't use you right now. That's what some of y'all need to tell some people. And it's going to hurt. And they're going to say, that's not very Christian-like. Well, listen, neither is losing all the time. At some point, we got to have victory. He takes his military intelligence. I was in the Army for six and a half years before I got hurt. And I remember when I would get like the the, the feedback and the in the in the marching orders and the in the plan and we'd set it into motion and this motion and this plan took a long time. Like you just didn't get your orders and you're like, all right, here's your orders, go. No, like I got my orders and it was like three months we go. Right? Because we had to figure out everything that the enemy had. We needed to know the strengths. We need to know the weaknesses. We need to know the imports, the outports, the good stuff, the bad stuff. We needed to know it all. But here's Joshua. He says, listen, all that I need to know is that the Lord is ahead of me. That's it. If that is true, then I'm good. And he positions himself to face it on head on. Here's your military intelligence. You're under attack. 
you're under attack. You don't have time to prepare. You don't have time to think about it. You don't have time to look for weaknesses in the, in the armor of your enemy. No, you're under attack. But all you need to know is that you're walking in victory. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Come on, that's good right there. Like you're, you're going through it, but someone else is too. You're struggling, but someone else is too. You're feeling defeated. Someone else is too. Here's what you need to know and get it down in your spirit. Get it down, and if you walk away with nothing else, know that you're walking in victory. You're walking in the promises of yes and amen. What you did yesterday, God's not worried about. Why? Because when you woke up this morning, you woke up with new mercies. You woke up with new grace. You woke up with new spirit inside of you that dwells every day. Why? Because God said, if you didn't need my mercies every day, there's no point for me to send Jesus to die on the cross. You need it. You're going to mess up. The first step in victory is realizing that we're at war with the enemy. You may not like war. You may not like fighting. You may like fighting. Some of y'all may like fighting too much. But the reality is, is that you're at war and it's being raged against you harder than ever. Especially now. Especially now. Especially in this church. The last time I came, it was one service. You all at two services. The enemy is wanting to destroy everything that y'all are doing inside this room, inside this church. Why? Because growth is evident. Growth is happening. It's proven. And if he can just get one or two of you to sit crossways, to look out a lens of, of, uh, of something that's not out of love, to look out of a lens that's something of defeat, then that one little person that's in this room is going to bring the whole shit down because we're going to have to look around you. We're going to have to look over you. Come on, listen to this. You have two options. You can either fight or you can live in defeat. Fight or live in defeat. I have two beautiful girls at the house and my son's at the house, but I tell them all the time. My oldest daughter is uh, getting into this dating scene now. She's 15, and she likes this boy who's 17, and he's already, he just graduated early. And she goes, Dad, I just, I like him a lot. And I said, listen, I'm cool. But if he looks at you ever and it's never a heck yes, then it's a heck no for me. You hear me? If he looks at you and he's like, I, it's, it's a heck, and it wasn't heck in my house, but we'll play it. If it's not a heck yes, then it's a heck no. And that's how you need to be with your friends. If you can look at them, the people you're locked arms with, and if it's not a heck yes, then it's a heck no until you get there. Because we ain't got time. We don't have time. You see, the, the world wants you to, to baby Christians and get them up there and, and to pat them on the back and to, to get them there. No, we need Christians that are not drinking milk. We need Christians that are eating meat. We need Christians that are going to stand up at the face of the enemy and say, not today, Satan. Not today. You're either going to fight or you're going to live in defeat. He's already won the victory for us on the cross. And the greatest thing is, is he's given us every weapon that we need to fight. But if you want to be victorious, you must get up and prepare ourselves to fight. But here's how you do it. He enlists his help. Right. First Joshua gets God's help. Right. Right. God gave him this thing. He says he hears from his father in a time of need because of this open communication and relationship. One of the greatest weapons we have is prayer. It's the connection that we have to the father who gave us victory long before we even faced our first enemy. Right? He said, listen, if you want to talk to me and me only, just pray. Just pray. Some of us, we get confused, right? We go to God when we need something. Right? And we mess prayer up 
and we'll make prayer really weird. Like, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. Lord, I'm, I'm struggling. I need this. Lord, if you just take this, I won't do that. And the Lord just wants to hear your heart. He knows what you need. He's not confused. He's not caught off guard. He knows it. But the next thing that Joshua did is he enlisted the help of his best fighters. We had thought he'd be crazy or even prideful if he had went to war by himself. But yet we all do that. We do that now. If I was to go around and I would say, hey, how are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Even though your whole world's crashing around you. Even though you're struggling with the worst possible experience in your life. No one's going to say, do you have time? Let me break it down for you. I'm doing, struggling with this, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with this. But no, we just, hey, we're good. Everything's Gucci, baby. Everything's good. I do this. We don't want everyone to know our struggles. We don't want everyone to know our dirty laundry. We don't want everyone to see us be vulnerable or to say we need something. Because why? Because fear of rejection or insecurity or fear of Facebook, right? Fear of being blasted out, right? We don't want to say, hey, I'm struggling with this porn addiction. Why? Because people instantly look at you differently like they ain't never struggled with anything. Like we, we give levels of sin. Right? Like, oh, you stole a car. Well, you just stole from the offering plate when you didn't give. Okay? We're going to set the levels. If God looks at sin as just being black and being sin, then we can't set levels on where we see people. Because then we're taking everything. And we're taking God's job. So listen. Find people you can trust. Find people you can rely on. Seek them out like Joshua did. He's already been through many of battles, right? This isn't Joshua's first battle. He's already seen how people react when they come up against war. And listen, this leadership team has already seen how you react when you come up against an obstacle. But here's where you change it, right? When the next one comes and you feel it come, and you know us in the church, hey, Pastor Adam, listen, I'm ready to go to war. I've done prayed up. I've done see it. I see it coming. I'll, listen, this is what I'm going to do. At your house, I'm going to pray for you at nighttime. For, for, I'm going to pray, pray for your kids. I'm going to pray for this church. I'm going to pray for this community. That shows you right there that you're willing to go up against any, any devil in hell. Right? You don't have to do something amazing, start a new ministry, do something crazy, go to Africa. No, just be able to fight when the war is here, when it's raging against you, when all hell's coming against this place, when all hell's breaking out in Kansas City. Rise up then and do something. I was watching a video, and it says, I tell God all the time I want to go and be sent to, to tell everybody about Jesus in other countries. It's like, bro, you can't even tell people about Jesus in Burlington Co. Factory. <laughs> Why? Why would he send you to another country to make everybody look weird? I would, this is a real story. I was at the airport, and I was sitting. The lady goes, hey, we have one spot. It's at the bar. It's like, it's been a long time since I sat at the bar, but I'll do it. I'm in another town. Ain't no one knows me. Ain't no judgment here. Right, so I sit at the bar, and there's this lady sitting next to me, and this old couple over here, and they're talking weirdo stuff, and I'm eating my food. And I'm hearing their conversation, and I'm like, I never want to get old, because that is some weird stuff happening over here. They're talking about people's birthdays from, like, aunts and uncles. It's weird. So I'm like, I just want to focus on my cheeseburger, my Diet Coke. Well, the lady goes, I'm talking to Lynn on speakerphone. I'm like, hey, my flight was delayed, you know, it's like, it's going to take another hour, da 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 I get off the phone. This lady goes, sorry, your plane was delayed. I'm like, yeah, it's all good, you know. She's like, what are you here for? I'm like, well, I'm technically not here, but I'm going to Kansas City to preach. And she goes, oh, one of those. And I said, what? I don't know what that is, but I don't want it. And uh, I don't know what one of those are. She's like, you're like, you, one of those. I'm like. I don't know what that means, so I need something more. She's like, you go and tell people about Jesus. Well, like, I hope we're doing that. Like, I hope that's part of it. And she's like, well, how long is that? 
I was like, the service? How long am I there? Like, what? This is so weird. <laughs> like, this is why I don't go to the bar, right? <laughs> Y'all talk about some crazy stuff. She's drinking her beer, and she's like, no, like, does it take a long time? I'm like, listen. So I'm like, all right, this is going to take forever getting your little questions. I'm like, I'm going to Kansas City. I'm going to preach two services. I'm going to preach about Joshua and how he got victory when it looked like he shouldn't have. I'm going to talk about a people group that called on Joshua. Why? Because he knew he could fight. I'm going to talk about Jesus to them that I can spread as much hope and as much revitalization as I possibly can in the amount of time that they allow me. She's like, wow. And she's like, but have you ever struggled, though? And I was like, yeah. So this opened up a door that I could talk about Phoenix, my son who passed. And I was like, my son passed away in 2020. I was in church. I was doing full-time ministry. And I never gave up on Jesus, even when I was facing the worst obstacle in my life. She's like, so I got to tell you something. She's like, I lost my brother eight years ago. She's like, and I've not said his name in eight years. She's like, and I've never stepped foot in a church in eight years. And she's like, how do you just say his name? And I was like, I just say it. I make room for him. And she goes, thank you so much for that. She's like, thank you for spreading hope. Thank you for spreading joy. And I was like, it's not anything that I'm doing. If I was just to spread what Matt would want to say, I would already told you these people are weird. I don't want to sit at the bar. I'm really feeling uncomfortable. But if because it's Jesus, I can tell you that he loves you even while you drink your beer. I can tell you that he loves these weird cats over here, even though they're talking about some weird stuff. But he loves you regardless of what you look like, what you're walking through, what you're going through. That he loves you. She says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of righteous person is powerful and effective. You were never meant to fight alone. The more you isolate yourself, the more you open yourself up for attacks. See, wisdom tells us that there's strength in numbers, right? When you isolate yourself, I tell students all the time, anytime that I've ever separated myself, when I took a step back, it is the loudest my life has ever been. Right? Because at this point, you took all the positive influence that you might get, and you kicked it away, and now you're relying solely on what you can hear. And if you're not right and in tune with the Lord, all you're hearing is enemy attack. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're ugly. You're fat. You shouldn't be here. Take yourself out. People don't need you. Why are you here? You're taking up space. Right? This is all you hear. But as soon as you step out and people haven't seen you, what happens? Man, it's so good to see you. Just occupy the space, baby. Come up front with me. We need to praise God together. It's so good to see you. Your heart, man, I see that twinkle in your eye. You got a little shape back. You're looking good. You're doing all right. And then you start going, okay, the enemy is a liar. The enemy is a liar. Connect yourself with those kind of people. The kind of people that haven't seen you in a while and they instantly give you a hug. They don't question where you've been. They don't question how long you've been gone. They don't question what you were doing while you were gone. They say, no, they welcome back. Thank God you came through these doors again. Thank God you came through here. Why? We think it's on us that they came. But no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws. So it has nothing to do with us. They came here seeking something from the Lord, and it just so happens they picked your place to do it. Come on. We get so caught up on where people go to church. But we don't celebrate that they're going. The third thing, confuse your enemy. Joshua's enemies were expecting him to fight, but not like this. They were not expecting Joshua to surprise attack them, right? No one expected Joshua to march through the whole night, right, to get there. They expect him to wake up in the morning, rally the troops, and say, all right, let's take this thing with a fresh start. But Joshua's like, nah. I got my best fighting men. They're prepared. They got some grit. They got some intestinal fortitude. We're going to march through the night. And it was a surprise that caused confusion among the enemies that led to their defeat. But how do we surprise attack our enemy? Right? You can't march up to anxiety. You can't march up on depression. Sometimes it marches up on us. This is what you do. The enemy wants you to think of yourself as a nobody, and you flip script and tell them you're a somebody. 
the enemy wants you to give into some kind of peer pressure with your friends. And this is where a lot of us struggle to just say, heck no. Heck no. If you're not for me, then you obviously are against me. If you're not locked in with me and know my struggles, then you're not for me for real, for real. The enemy wants you to believe that you're all alone. Well, just look around. The enemy wants to believe that no one will understand your struggle. I promise you, I understand. I promise you, I understand. I promise you, your pastors understand that you're not alone. The enemy wants you to seclude yourself from your family and your friends. But here's the greatest thing that the enemy expects. He expects you to give up. He expects you to lose. He expects you to lay down. So if we do the opposite, and we do the exact thing that God has called us to do, to rise up, to stand up, to say no, to push back, to not isolate, but to get invested, to not pull back, but to dive deep in. And sometimes that's scary for us, right? If you get so invested, right, if it causes you to place down some roots that you can't just pull up whenever you feel like dipping out or whenever you feel like getting upset, right? It takes a little work to rip out of the ground. But this is what will happen. Do the exact thing God wants you to do that the enemy is betting you won't do. And the devil will be so confused. He'll have no choice but to flee. Anxiety and depression and, and self-harm and all of these things that the enemy tries to use against you. I'm not saying that as soon as you say no, that this is going to leave, but it could. I'm not saying that as soon as you say I'm never going to do drugs again, that it will leave forever, but it could. In 2013, I stopped doing drugs. I stopped drinking. I stopped associating with anybody that was. And people, I don't, I'm not able to speak at Celebrate Recovery anymore because whenever I come in to speak, they say, how, how long did it take you to complete? And I was like, complete what? They're like the steps. It's like one step, bro. I got up from the front. I came here. I said, I don't want to do it no more. Lord, pick me up off the ground. I don't want this anymore. And this is what it is. The Lord is a mind-working God. And when I made up my mind, the Lord said, I'll meet you right here where you're at. And when I stepped up from the ground, I no longer wanted to be around these people. And because I wasn't around these people, I no longer had the urge to do such a thing. And I began to get around people that were like-minded, that wanted to go right, that wanted to do right, that wanted to walk this thing out. And what happened is, is they pushed positivity that says, hey, you normally fill this with marijuana. Fill this with the word. You normally fill this with women. Fill this with worship. You normally fill this with this. Fill it with this. You normally filled your mind with lust. Fill it with prayer. And what happened? Every one of those desires left. Why? Because I desired his face more than I desired his hand. <laughs> I desired his presence more than I desired anything else. So if you want change and you want victory, you have to fight a little bit to get it. My last point is probably the most important of any of them. It's pray to not be prey. Pray to not be prey. Oh, can we get someone on the keys? Anybody? Or a guitar? Or you can just hum. It's cool. <laughs> pray that you don't become prey. The enemy's looking for just a crack or a crevice. Just a couple weeks ago, I went back to Louisiana for a funeral. And it was a mentor of mine, a pastor through Bible college. And the enemy found a foothold at some point in his life and crept in. And he ended up passing away, but not until he lost his ministry, his family, friends. Why? He had everything. He was leading a church of a thousand people great family, beautiful family, but the enemy found a foothold, right? And if you're not constantly praying, 
for God to cover, for God to walk with, and you feel like you've got it all together, your clothes fit nice, you come to church, everything's Gucci, you look in good, people aren't questioning your walk anymore, and you start laying it down, you say, ah, oh, good, I can finally relax, I've tricked everybody. Right? We do that. If I worship real hard on Sunday, no one will question that I'm acting a fool when I'm not around people. But the enemy's looking for something that he can just grab a hold of. And it's always going to be a familiar spirit. It's not going to be, if I struggle with lust, God's not going to come up and drop drugs. That's not for me. I would recognize that. Right? They'd be like, ooh, that's weird. I don't know what that is. But if I struggle with lust my whole life, but I feel like the Lord has delivered me from that, but I left a little spot open, and he throws just a little bit of in there, that familiar spirit saying, hey. Right? And then next thing you know, that hey is like, hey. And then before you know it, I've lost everything because I've dove so hard back into that one thing. So the last point, probably the most important, is pray that you don't become prey. Because the enemy's looking. He's searching. And he's waiting. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says this. And we can stand up. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. There's victory in Jesus' name. Come on, there's victory in Jesus' name. Listen, you're the one on the winning side. I don't care what the enemy's telling you right now. You might feel defeated. Your money might look funny. But I promise you, you're on the winning side. Come on. Here's the greatest thing. Let's fight like it. Let's fight like it. If you have an opportunity to praise God, you need to do it. It doesn't matter where it's at. It doesn't matter who's around. One last story. This has been a crazy trip. From the point of getting to the airport to getting here, that I knew this service was going to be special. In the airport, I've got a three-year-old son. He'll be three in a, in a month. But I saw this little boy, and he's like, Dad, my knees hurt. My knees hurt. And it reminded me of my son. So, and, and it brought me back to sitting there with my son. And I walk up to this dad, and I said, hey, can I pray for your son? And he goes, no. no. Kind of weird, you know. Like, and I was like, well, listen. I was like, I'm going to slide two seats down, and I'm going to pray for your son because I've got crazy enough faith to believe that I don't have to touch him. I don't have to be close to him for him to get healed. And he gave me this weird dad nod, like, okay. And so I prayed hard for this young man because it reminded me of my son. I was like, I want your knees to feel better. And in my prayer, I'm like, Lord, touch his knees. You know, I was like, that's where I'm at. And I went, and I got my burger, I ate, and I found my gate. And I see this dad come up, and he's got his son in his arms, and his son's making all this noise. He ain't crying no more. And he said, I had to find you. And his, his son looks at me, he's like, my knees feel better. And I started laughing, but then I started crying. Because how many times have us as Christians taken people's no as our own? And just said, all right, you don't want it, it's cool. But we've all seen God do it. We've all seen God show up in a mighty way in your life and in other people's lives. And we'll know that they'll do it for them even if they're saying no. But we take their no as our own. We're like, all right, suffer then. Right? You're on the winning side. You know who's fighting. You know who's ahead of you. These last three things is something I've ended every service 
forever with is that you're a somebody, you have a purpose, and you matter. You're a somebody, you have a purpose.